Hey everybody, welcome back this week. Thanks for joining me. Hopefully everybody is staying safe and, and having a good week. So this week we're going to continue our journey to design a game together. And if you're new to this, um, this thing, we're kind of, you know, on our third week this week, I believe, um, in trying to work together to design a game. Um, the, the purpose again of this is to try to kind of try and show um, everyone how to go from um, nothing to, to creating a game idea. And so this is supposed to be a brainstorming session. Um, I want, you know, to reiterate, this is for everybody and for everyone. Um, there's no good or bad ideas. This is for all of us to work together to design a game together. And so I hope that everybody will participate and that everybody will be, you know, able to, um, to, to, give some ideas and some suggestions and stuff um, on what we're doing, you know, here. And so um, to recap, you know, really, really quickly, you know, if you haven't um, seen the previous talks, you know, on this particular subject, um, we kind of went from talking about world building um, over a course of about six weeks. And now we're kind of diving into sort of building this game together. And so, um, again, there's no kind of right or wrong ideas here in that we, we're going to kind of go in a direction I, I think we should go in today. But again, um, if anybody has any ideas at all, like they're even different and going in a different direction, um, please feel free to bring them up and, you know, and let's talk about them. And um, that's an okay thing, right? You know, you know, in the brainstorming sessions, whether we're going down a different genre of game or a different type of game or whatever, this is still a time and a place to, to have those types of conversations. So last week we got down some rabbit holes that weren't necessarily, um, they were good, I think, from a production standpoint of trying to reiterate the importance of, of how you work and, and, you know, and some techniques and ideas for working and stuff like that. Um, but we didn't get great into our game design and our game ideas. And I apologize. Sometimes it's hard in these, you know, live streams where I'm not prepared, you know, and we're just kind of going in random directions to sometimes not um, go in the right directions here. So I'm going to try really hard this week to keep us on track for brainstorming a game idea. And again, this is hard because we're, we're going to spend a couple hours a week doing this. But, you know, in, in reality, you know, in a day, you know, if, if this was our job, we'd be spending eight hours a day, you know, or 10 hours a day or 20 hours a day doing this, you know. And so so for us to only do this two hours a week, it's going to take a long time. So we're, we're going to shortcut some of that process. And I'll try to kind of explain you know, where the, the process is, is being shortcuts and where it's, you know, being, being used. So, um, hi, Max Magnus, um, welcome. And, um, everybody else again, welcome to the, to the channel this week. And let's dive in really quick. Um, do a very high level overview of kind of where we've come on um, the last couple weeks. And then I want to just dive in and, and really start, you know, designing this game. And again, you know, please, please, please ask questions, please chat, communicate. I know it can be a little hard in text messaging um, to, you know, to chat, you know, and to, to ideate um, these things, but, but please do your best and please feel free to, to you know, ask questions or, or, or contribute in any, any way you want. So where are we? Um, so right now, the, the idea for this game um, in its current, you know, uh, you know state is that we want to do a you know some, design something that's kind of triple A, um, meaning it's got you know decent budget, decent sized team. So we're not going to limit ourselves too much. We're not necessarily you know trying to go after and do a Ubisoft style Assassin's Creed or something with a thousand people. Um, but we have you know we we want to assume that this is going to be a really big project and a competitive project you know at a big level. So we're not really worrying too much about the scope and scale. Um, we also want to make sure that it's original, but not like completely like, you know, having everything um, totally original from the ground up. Um, I talk about like a 80, 20 or 70, 30 rule of like, you know, it needs to be recognizable, needs to have stuff that's sort of in it. And then we find our innovation. We find a couple key, what we call core pillars to make that thing interesting. Um, and so again, we don't want to just create something that's completely random of, you know, like it's never been done or never been seen before. And we talked a lot, you know, last week really kind of got down the rabbit hole of like, you know, what's the market like? What, you know, and trying to understand like how do we determine, you know, where some opportunities are 
um, you know, looking at products, looking at genres, looking at different games, trying to understand like, well, how many has been sold there? You know, because we ultimately have to, as game designers, make an argument for our ideas and say, this is why I think people will play it. But also here's some proof. Like here's some stuff of why it, you know, it would, um, you know, be provable of like why people would, would want this. Um, and we're also, you know, um, going towards something just single player for now and not going to worry about multiplayer. Hi, Luke. Thanks for joining us. Um, so he says, I was hoping at some point we could speak to methods used to keep ideas small and manageable. It's always easy to come up with huge ideas that end up being hard to actualize. So there's a couple levels to, to that problem, Luke. And I, and I don't know that it, that there is a, there's not a turnkey answer that like is the, is the one thing that's like, Oh, here's how you, you, you know, experience ultimately is kind of what, what determines, you know, the ideation process of like, you know, how big should this thing be? Um, one of the things you can do is look at the competition. And so you, you can look at a, a competitive product and this is um, what I call back of the box game design. And I'm not a fan of it, but it's one methodology for understanding how big something should be. So for example, um, how long is the, is, you know, if you, if you determine say five competitive games, um, you know, how long are those on average? You know, is it a 10 hour experience? Is it a 20 hour experience or 50 hours? Whatever that is, so so what is the the target length of the game, and that that has a huge factor in kind of the scope and scale that you're trying to, to scope all of your ideas and things too. Because if you have a, a five hour game and you're trying to put 500 gameplay features in, you'll know that like you're never going to put 500 new features into a five hour experience, right? And so if you have 500 new features, maybe in a 50 hour experience, possibly. I mean, that's you know an extreme example, I know, but I'm just using that to to say you can. You know, by knowing the, the size of the overall game that you need to make, you know, that has a huge, you know, impact on, on stuff. You can also break down competitive games by like how many levels they have, you know, how many characters do they have, how many weapons do they have, how many enemies do they have, you know, all that data that you can use. And that's what we call it back of the box. Cause you know, for those of you old timers like me that you remember when we used to actually have these things called game boxes and, you know, and people used to buy things in these retail stores um, I guess we occasionally do now, but you know, a little, little antiquated idea there. Um, the, you, we literally would pull out the back of a box, like, um, can't really see this here, but you know, this game like armor command where we would literally have a bunch of, oops, a bunch of features like listed. You can't read it here, but just using it as an example, we would literally say like, here are the features, you know, of the game. This one had a, a flap on it. And so you know, we literally would go to a competitive game and say, oh, well, this, you know, this game has 13 weapons and the marketing department would come back to us and say, well, you need to do 15 weapons to make your game better. And I'd always kind of laugh and I go like, well, 15 does not mean it's better than 13. Like more is not always better. You know, a better game is a better game, right? I, I would rather do a game with 11 weapons that was amazing than a game with, you know, 13 or 15 weapons that were mediocre, right? And so... But that is one way of at least ballparking day one how much you need to have, right? And how to limit those ideas. Second thing or third thing is um, I try to do a minimum of three to four new things. And so if you find yourself doing 20 new things, you, you're doing way too much, you know? And so the innovation needs to be core and what you determine is innovation and the stuff that's there, you know, three, maybe five things at most. And that helps you kind of limit, you know, your ideas and and, um, and scope and scale there. And then once you're out of this ideation brainstorming process, which we're in now, right now it's not so good to limit yourself. You're, you're trying to kind of come up with a lot of things and see what sticks, you know, and and see even what the competitors have, and you know, understand, you know, what you what you need to build, you know, to make this thing something you know a player wants to play and something they're willing to pay money for, right? Um, and um, and some of that, you know, also if you're doing a free-to-play game or live operations, you know, other things have other factors about like what you build and when you build it. So don't don't forget that is also a factor of, you know, keeping your scope and scale for your launch product, your MVP or whatever that is, can be like this. But your overall plan might be something much bigger, um, That, but you may not achieve that for a year or two after launch you know, if you're going to do live operations or something. And so so the, the feature creep or those additional features can sometimes be built in that kind of a production process as well. 
Now, once you've kind of identified what we're going to work towards in this class and you know, in this exercise over maybe a few months, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get there, but, but ultimately is identifying what I call the core pillars. And the core pillars are the core main things that are in a game, you know, that, that really make them distinct. And, and then when you, when you create those core pillars, um, which is a lot of what my class talks about, a lot of the course at CG Spectrum talks about the core pillars and how to create them and, and stuff like that. And then once you create those core pillars, um, those create those, those three or four things then become the things that you, you, you measure everything else by. And so if those things aren't part of that core game, it's fat and you can cut it. And so those core pillars are there to really help keep you focused more than anything and also keep you from trying to do too much. But getting towards to those core pillars is one of the most important things, in my opinion. And if you can't get to that, if you can't really narrow down what this game is and why these three to five things are special um, and then and stuff, then you can always measure and say like, oh, I want spaceships in my game. Oh, well, it's not in the core. It's not one of my core pillars. So let's save it for later. And then that becomes one of the biggest things for how to try to control your ideas. So hopefully, look, that gives you a, a high-level overview of, of kind of, of some ideas or techniques for limiting your, your scopes. Um, um, Max Minus, did you play games on Congregate? There's a huge hole to fill in Flash games or small online games. A tiny bit. I, I've been involved in a, a few small projects that were, you know, some Flash-based games and some stuff like that. Um I, I'm not sure, honestly, right now in today's market where the Flash games and where that market is from a, you know, a need perspective, um, from a monetization perspective, you know, as a business, right? So if you're just making a game to get it out there, um, Congregate seemed like it could be really fun, but I, the times I've tried to work within it um, and the people I've talked to, um, monetizing off of it became really difficult. And so that's why a lot of people avoided it. And, um, and so that's where congregates and flash games in general are either like this hyper saturated market, which a lot of it transitioned to mobile. Um, it doesn't mean that there's still not a market there, but you just have to identify like, is there a market there? And is it something I can really capitalize on and actually monetize, you know, is everybody just want everything for free? And so that's the, that's the challenge of why I've tried to, um, um, avoid congregate kind of in general. So you said you watched a review of a game that, was, uh, that is a nostalgia game that came from Congregate. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, again, there's good opportunity in Congregate and, you know, in some of these other platforms, um, you know, for this, for the course of this conversation, we're, uh, and, and even for my entire course, um, it's about learning how to be a AAA game designer. And so I've, I've chosen to kind of focus on that in my course just because, you um, you know, I think if you understand how to make really big AAA PC console kinds of games, um, then it, that, you know, and, and working for like a big AAA studio, um, it, it's much easier to like make a small game for a small studio, like go into an indie or whatever. But if you learn the processes and practices of an indie, it's much, much harder to transition up to a AAA team and stuff like that. So that's why my course kind of focuses there because most people dream or aspire to be working in, in AAA stuff. Um, and so, um, so it's just, uh, that's why, you know, why I focus more in that area because it does tend to be an area that, you know, has a better business model, you know, for me and as a professional company, that's been tough, but, um, yeah, I don't know Union City, um, but it is a, like I said, it is a tricky business model and I haven't looked at it in years, so I really can't, you know, comment about where its current state is, you know, as far as feasibility and stuff. All right. Um, so let's dive in, um, guys, keep asking questions and keep, you know, commenting here again, let's, let's blow through this, um, the, what we're trying to make and some of the ideas and then let's get to the, the good stuff. All right. So we want to do something kind of action RPG. We've talked about maybe having some survival game, um, kinds of features that's still, you know, a little bit, um, TBD. So I think the, right now the survival features, I think a lot of people really liked, some, some of the survival games and survival features, but we also recognize there's some good and bad about them. And so we're going to kind of put that on a, on a wish list and see if the, the concept of, of what a survival game offers um, makes sense for this particular project. And so, um, so that's where we'll, we'll come back to the, the survival game stuff. Um, 
The next thing that we, we all kind of agreed on or, or liked was doing something science fiction. So for right now, we're going to do something sci-fi or in some manner, you know, futuristic. And, and sci-fi is a massive bucket, right? That can mean a lot of things. You know, that could be all on one planet. It can be multiple planets and universes. It could be aliens or not. You know, so near future versus sci-fi, like we don't know yet, right? This is this is something we need to kind of figure out. Um, we want to do something more character driven. Um, and whether that is a over the shoulder kind of camera or, or something like that, um, I'm leaning towards something that is not first person, um, and probably not God view. Um, although last week we kind of got into some games that had more of a, a higher level view to allow you for a four player. Um, I'm not sure that that's the route we really want to go, but that's, you know, there, this is not locked in. Um, but just something we're, we're looking at. And then um, also we're going to build a franchise here. So, um, well, real quick, we did have an idea about some asteroids and, and doing some stuff on an asteroid. And again, I don't know whether that fits into the current plan or not. Um, so the asteroids um, idea, along with the survival game stuff, I think are, are all kind of TBD um, on what we're going to do. All right. Um, one second here. So last week I started talking about superheroes and kind of got down some tangents of looking at superheroes and I want to explore. And again, if anybody has any other ideas, please, you know, chime in here, but we need to shortcut the process. We, we can't debate all day long, you know, what we want to do or which direction. And so I'm kind of making a creative director choice about like which direction to kind of go in and and why. And so I want us to explore, it doesn't necessarily mean this will be our final game idea, but I'd like to explore today at least and, and, and stuff on doing a superhero game. Now, I wanna do an, an original superhero game, uh, meaning building my own IP, my own universe, not trying to license Marvel or DC or any of the, the traditional ones. Um, you know, we looked um, last week at um, a bunch of game examples and movie examples and some stuff like that. Um, we put down some kind of rough statistics of what some of these games were, like how successful they were. Um, and um, and so we, we kind of validated, at least in my opinion, enough that we understand that, that, the, that the, the superhero game market is finicky. Like even the, the the licensed Marvel stuff can can be hit or miss. Um, you know, I think that the the Marvel Avengers game was a perfect example of a really 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 you know horribly expensive game, um, and um, and did really you know really really bad. And so the you know it I don't know if we I think we wrote down the stats here. Um, Yeah, I thought we had written down how much it had lost, but um, yeah, I think the Marvel Avengers had um, had made about forty-seven million roughly dollars out of a rumored like hundred million dollar or more um, budget, and so this one had done did really badly both in reviews um, and in um, in statistics, but. Um, like Arkham City, you know, did 12 million copies, so four times as many copies, you know, and had $600 million in revenue, right? So um, so we can show that superhero games in general um, are kind of all over the board in, in revenue, but they've all done relatively well. And part of what I'm trying to do is build a AAA game, but I don't want to go as big as Marvel Avengers in budget or something like that. So, you know, I'm looking at something that's 25 to $40 million or something that's reasonable, I consider, in scope and scale and in budget. So that also then lowers, you know, our what we call break-even. The break-even is how many copies do I need to sell in order to, you know, break even with my, with my budget. So in this particular case, if you think about 3 million copies is making them $47 million. So if I had a development budget and marketing budget together, um, so if my total budget is around $50 million, so let's just assume now I spend 25 on development, 25 on marketing, spend 50 million altogether. That's a pretty big game. Um, not huge, but pretty big. Um, I would need to sell roughly 3 million copies or actually more than that to, to break even because the 3 million, you know, I don't know where their revenue stats, if that was 
total revenue off the three million or how much the developer, you know, and, and or publisher makes. So, you know, it might be they actually need to make about six, sell about six million copies to break even because, you know, half of your revenue might be going to platforms like Xbox, PlayStation, publishers, you know, other license, you know, licensing type agreements or whatever it is. But you have to figure out how much money are you going to make in the end and then how many copies do I got to sell to make that much money to at least, you know, to, to recoup my development costs and my marketing costs. And that's called the break even. So we need to, as game designers, come up with, you know, a game idea that we know within some certainty will at least hit a break even. And that's our worst, worst, worst case scenario. We don't want to lose money, but we want to at least be like, okay, I want to at least, you know, um, recoup and not, you know, lose anything. And, you know, and because and, and, if you lose money, that's probably where you lose your job. <laughs> and so that's kind of the, the important thing. But... My thinking is that the, 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 the movies and the superhero movies have been um, incredibly successful. So if you look at like the, the Marvel Avengers movie, had about 100 million viewers that, that they say. Now, I don't know if that's movie you know, viewers in theaters, if that includes... TV viewers, you know, what the total audience size is, but you can, you can imagine it's a hundred million plus viewers. Um, so that's, you know, 10 X what a lot of the games are getting, you know, in total viewership. So it tells me there's, there is an audience there who likes superheroes and we've seen one superhero movie after another, after another come out, you know, and they've done really well. And so, um, so I think there is, potential for a new and original superhero game that could do really well. So I want to make a, um, you know, an action RPG, you know, superhero game. And, and I'll take away these question marks, you know, for now. And um, make it into a, you know, in a sci-fi ish world. Um, and so whether that, because if you, if you look at most of the, the superhero games, IPs, most of them take place in kind of our existing, at least Earth, you know, human universe now, right? And so I really want us to get into it and build something that's a sci fi superhero universe, you know, that's got some RPG mechanics. Um, and so, you know, again, probably gameplay, you know, more, more like the, the Marvel Avengers game, but. But again, still something that's that's reasonable and, and feasible, you know. There. So now the other um, the other last idea I'll talk about just that we had this idea of these large scale battles, and we spent a bunch of time on this last week. And so I, I really do want to incorporate this. Um, I I really like the idea um, that you have you know these kind of one on many battles, you know, and that can be. Um, Ultimately, something where you know I have one really super, you know, one really powerful superhero, or maybe a couple, um, in my in my stable, and um, and then I can take them against you know big armies of, of stuff, you know, there, and so um, so that is something that really interests me a lot. And then also last week we talked a little bit about um, some GURP stuff, and so let's go to. So again, for those of you who 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 are new to, to GURPS, this is a thing by Steve Jackson Games. Um, um, I think it's sggames.com, um, and they have all of these books digital now that you can buy. And um, so they happen to have a superheroes RPG, you know, pen and paper RPG. And so this was also going to be something that, to me, is a um, a brainstorming tool that we can we can go through and again to be clear we're not using these for the rpg mechanics we're not using these books to try and define you know what the the, the actual rpg is what we're doing this is kind of thinking about this as a compendium of ideas and ideation for what kinds of superheroes are out there you know what what interests us and stuff and so let's take you know a quick look at this and um um and brainstorm this a little bit to just kind of see, um, I'm just going to spend, I don't know, five or 10 minutes, like basically going through this really fast and I'll show you what catches my attention 
and show you like why certain things, what I'm looking for, right? So when I'm looking at these documents, what are the things I'm trying to catch? What are the things that I'm getting ideas from? And how how is this thing inspiring me, right? And that's what I want you guys to understand today is like, how can you look at reference material? Um, and in this particular case, it's we're looking for, for world building. You know, we're looking for gameplay ideas. We're looking for things like that. Um, these are not going to be gameplay mechanics um, because this is a pen and paper game, right? Um, but, and we're not going to take this stuff literal, but it's really just a, a tool for us to use for brainstorming. So, um, Max, let's see. I listened to a script writer lecture a month ago. What he said is there is a huge need for audience to recognize that um, Heroes World book. So, not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, you know, um, so what do you mean, mean by audience to recognize that, you know, Heroes World book? Um, yeah, I mean, licensing mechanics and, and getting RPG mechanics, you know, look at the new Cyberpunk game. You know, that was licensed from um, a friend of mine, Mike Pondsmith, at our Talsarian Games. You know, that was originally a pen and paper game, and they, they took, um, you know, stuff. And, yes, I, I don't disagree that a license um, is is sometimes a really good thing. Um, the problem is, is that the licenses, yes, the, the licenses for established superhero stuff is so expensive that they're really kind of cost prohibitive for a lot of games. And so it's um, it's very, the, the, the cost... For just what for just what would it cost you to license a superhero game can be a quarter of your budget, you know, and that's that's doesn't even get you anything but the the you know the ability to to use that you know those those characters and so you have to be really careful with licenses and I do agree that in a normal world it would be worth looking at a license, um, but in this particular case for the exercise that we're going to go through I want to do something new and original and and that's a very different problem than than using a licensed um property and so maybe if we have time and people are interested once we finish this exercise you know um something that i've done actually and have done a number of times is that um um i've pitched a new and original idea to a publisher and then that publisher has come back like lucas arts with star wars and like this game armor command that that bah, um that I was showing you the box of a minute ago, we pitched the sequel of that to LucasArts um, for them to publish. And they came back to us and said, well, we love the game. We like the ideas. We like the, the strategy elements. But can you go make this Star Wars? And so then that ultimately became Star Wars Force Commander. You know, And we took the same engine and kind of reskinned it and made it Star Wars. And so as an exercise, that could be something we could try to do if people are interested later to take a generic superhero game and then reskin it to say Marvel or DC or something and see what it's like to build a license game and, and how you work within the restrictions of a license um, versus a new and original IP. So, um, so, but yeah, just be aware of a lot of the, the, the bigger the licenses, um, the more expensive they are, you know, and, and a lot of, a lot of licensors in Hollywood and stuff like that still have not fully caught on like what the revenue models and games are. And they quite often want way more money than what the, the, in my opinion, what the license is worth. And therefore a lot of the, the license games really suffer because you spend so much money on the license that, you know, when it comes to making the game, you end up cutting a lot of corners. So that's the challenge. All right. So let's, Move on. Um, I don't know. I'm going to um, let me see how to do this here. That would be the best for everybody. I'm afraid that you guys cannot read this. Um, and so because of the size of the text, um, I will zoom in. So I'm here. Let's see. Um, Let's see, what's the, nope. All right. Okay, well hopefully everybody can read this. This, this is not, I'm gonna kind of go through fast, so don't feel like you, can, you have to read this, but just kind of, I want you guys to kind of get a sense for, for what I'm reading. 
Um, so, you know, they, they give a lot of background and stuff, um, you know, and they talk about, you know, like some of these superheroes could be science, you know, meaning, you know, these could be things that we created. Um, they talk about some of these things could be, you know, just superhumans, meaning people that just like mutants, you know, the X-Men, things like that, right? That they, they're there. They, they, they could be a lost race like the Atlanteans um, or something. Um, they could be extraterrestrial like aliens, you know, or something else, right? Um, the science could also be, you know, Iron Man, you know, things like that. So Iron Man, Batman, you know, things like that, you could argue are kind of the prodigies of science, meaning... You know, somebody built and created these things. Um, it's there. And as a side note, one of my ideas was to incorporate robots and mechs and stuff into this as well. I think it would be a, um, a fun world. Um, I think one of the new original things that I really wanted to do, and let's make sure it's in there. Let's see. I thought we wrote it down, but... Um, so one of the things I want to put in here are robots and mechs. Um, All right, so sorry, I'm multitasking here. Um, so one of the things that you know I think would be really fun is is to incorporate again robots and mechs, you know, and those could be you know really big, massive, um, you know, um, size like I don't know, um, you know, stuff that is going to be you know anything could be anything from a human size like Iron Man type character which is obviously a superhero and, and does and he functions very you know very very well maybe one of the best superheroes out there Iron Man as far as his power and his abilities all coming from this you know man-made suit um all the way up to you know the um the Gundams or you know um um you know the mech warrior style you know um um, whatever that is, you know, type big giant, you know, hundreds of feet tall type mechs, you know, these, you know, um, um, and I think that would be very interesting to have, you know, in there. So, um, again, guys, please, you know, this is a brainstorming session. So if you have ideas and you have any things around superheroes, around robots and mechs, um, things like that, please speak up here. This is not me talking. This is, this is me brainstorming. And so, um, again, right now I'm coming up with ideas for superheroes and, um, and so we need to, you know, feel free to, again, all chime in there. Um, yeah. And so I think the, the Max, the, the, the threat, the robots could be kind of similar to the Avengers movies where if you remember the ending and the big battle, there was like, I don't know, snake like weird things that were, um, attacking which were basically robots right and so they the avengers were kind of using um it's been a while since i've seen the movie so i have to refresh my memory on all the the intricacies of which villains were in that in that movie but remember they came from like another world they came from another portal and they came in and were almost giant robots but you know in order to fight people who are superhuman to fight you know um these superheroes you know you're either going to need other superheroes or you're going to need, you know, giant mechs or something, right? So, so if it's if the if the bad guy and the villain, or even the good guy, I mean, it could be that that maybe the human. Let's assume right now we're humans, right? And human, you know, on Earth, I mean, maybe you know, maybe we also build some giant mechs along with our superheroes, and they can fight side by side together to make them better. Um, so there's a lot of ways we can we can do mechs and you know and robots and all that kind of stuff so i don't want to limit that yet to be on one side or the other but i just like conceptually this idea that there can be some sort of man-made things that are you being used to battle you know the, the the superhuman you know characters on both sides and um it's a nice twist of scope and scale meaning like i've got little small guys and i've got big massive 
things, right? And, and the, the Avengers movies and stuff will try to do some of that as well, where it feels like this big thing that's going to crush you, you know. Um, like if I remember, like Sandman, some people like that, like they would turn into this like big giant thing and like Spider-Man's trying to fight him, but you know, Sp Spider-Man's just tiny in comparison to him, right? Um, so it, scope and scale are important in creating tension, you know, and making things feel powerful and big. And that's why like we're all afraid of like Godzilla and King Kong and, you know, things like that, right? And, and big giant mechs and Gundams or whatever those things are, or, or, you know, all the Japanese kaiju from like Ultraman, you know, and things. And so any of these things are really big, right? They have a lot of power, you know, if they're much bigger, you know, than us. So, so that's something that's um, to keep in mind why, you know, that, that can be an interesting thing. Um, so Luke, oh wait, um, so Max, um, is it planets or cities or secret sites? Um, we don't know yet, you know, um, so what we can do here, you know, in our, and so part of this brainstorming session is, you know, um, is, is jotting down. So as we think of things, as people ask questions, right, um, we write them down, right? We may not know yet what locations are in the game, you know, um, and um, and so part of this exercise process of using systemic design is that, but we have to kind of realize that a lot of these things are are natural questions we have to ask ourselves as game designers, right? Where is the location the game going to take place, like? We have to ask ourselves that because we need to know this thing and we need to know that sometimes sooner than later, maybe not all the locations, but we do need to kind of know what these locations are, right? And so, so by, we don't necessarily need to answer this day one, but we need to, um, we need to remember to come back and like ask ourselves these things like sooner than later. And so I don't know yet, uh, Max, if we have enough information to answer um, that question. Um, and, um, you know, but I think that is a really, it's a really good point and we need to come back to that, but let's try to figure out some of the core mechanics and some of the core of what this thing is. And then kind of keep working back and forth between, you know, what, what's going to be a fun location to be in. Um, like for example, do we want to have cities? Um, so, you know, this is again, brainstorming, right? We don't want to lose things. Um, um, So, you know, um, let's call this random brainstorming ideas. So I don't, when I, when my brain goes off at a thousand tangents, I don't want to lose ideas. Right. But sometimes if I stop, I'm, I'm working on something, work on something and I got, Whoa, random idea, rabbit hole. Like, you know, and I, and I don't want to go down that hole. I want to be careful. There's times and places I may go down a rabbit hole, come back to this idea and keep going forward, but you need to be careful about those things. And so, so trying to not lose the idea, but also like trying to, you know, keep yourself focused sometimes to design what you need to design is important. And that's a, it's a delicate balance. Um, so I like to write down all my ideas and not lose them. And so, um, So, so my idea um, related to Max, your, your question, you know, when I started thinking about cities and again, if I have Godzilla and I have, you know, and I think about the, those kinds of things, um, by the way, if you haven't seen the new, like, um, King Kong versus Godzilla trailer, go, go check that out. Looks amazing. Like d definitely looking, looking forward to that. Um, but so when you have these kaiju and you have these big battles and think about the Avengers movies and all these things that are really big and powerful. And I don't care if you're human sized, right? You can be human and, and you're Superman or, or whatever, right? You're going to blow things up, right? It's just, that's, you know, things are happening. You're, you're the Hulk even or whatever, right? And you just Hulk throws things and just, you know, entire buildings collapse. And, you know, there's just massive chaos in a lot of the movies and a lot of that stuff. And so... Um, so one of the, the technical things and from a design perspective, I would like to talk about, you know, but I don't want to talk about it now is massive destruction, right? Can we go into cities or go into things and have that ability as a very powerful being? I need to feel powerful. 
So how how am I feeling powerful? Well, I, you know, if I'm doing massive destruction, if I'm fighting things that are really difficult, if I'm fighting these big battles, you know, those kinds of things, right? Those are things that make me feel powerful. And so the the dream, you know, and the the user experience that we're after, I think, in in creating a superhero game is that we we want the superheroes, you know, to feel really powerful. That that the player experience, he needs to feel like he's a superhero, right? I don't want to just like watch a movie and feel like, yeah, this guy over here, you know, that's on my screen, like he's he's really powerful. Like, no, I want to feel powerful, right? Me as a player is there. So I want to find ways to do that. And massive destruction is one of those ways, you know, that's there. And I'll even just put in the note of um, player needs to feel very powerful, you know, right? So that to me is kind of a key important thing. All right, um, and then um, you know, and then to Max and Luke, like talking about you guys' ideas here, real quick. So you know, um, so again, these are things you know. You guys are asking questions, right? And I don't want to lose these things, these ideas and thoughts, but I, but I may not know answers yet. And so there's times and places to go chase those things, but we have to be careful again, not to go too far down these rabbit holes and things. But I want to make sure to understand, you know, um, who these things are, right? Um, so... So you can see that the, um, you know, that just that single question and we start thinking about like who an enemy is, right? The natural things again with that systemic design of like, oh, okay, I have enemies, right? You know, and I have to ask these questions, right? And I may not again answer these today. We may not talk about these today, but we don't want to forget those things. But, but often when we're in these beginning stages, we're just kind of putting random things down, right? Um, and so um, I also want to put a little section. So for game mechanics brainstorming, um, and actually let's put this up. We'll move this copy and paste and we'll, um, so you can see here again, just like we're, we're starting to rough in you know, these things, right? Like, what are these things? And understanding, like, we need game mechanics. We need story. You know, we need to know um, who the enemies, you know, and that's not even a question mark, enemies, you know. Um, and then even part of that is, um, um, So who are the, you know, who are the players and who are the superheroes, right? So, um, you know, um, so you can see, you know, um, you know, that, that these, these questions kind of start falling, falling in place here. So let me kind of keep up with your guys' questions and, and thanks Max and Luke especially and hi Miguel, um, welcome. Um, you know, um, thanks for all the help and everybody else please chime in and and, um, and help us out here. Okay. Um, so yes, the um, so Luke, I think in terms of supers that the Incredibles um, dynamics with four, maybe more or less fighting these massive mechs in metropolitan areas is really compelling. Yes, I agree. So, um, you know, um, oops. So...
Um, so, again, these are kind of important points that we have to kind of, you know, we have to figure out here. Um, but I agree, like having like up to four characters is more compelling. I like collection um, games where you need to figure out how to kind of a strategy tactics level of like four things that go together, like the Incredibles or whatever those things are. And these, these things all balance themselves, you know, and the player has to figure out like, you know, kind of what classes of characters am I going in there, right? Am I going to take in, you know, three tanks and a healer? Like that may not work, you know, and do I want what kind of, of class so to speak, right, of, of character, what type of powers, what types of abilities, you know, and we want to kind of create, you know, these these character classes. And that's really the, the nature of these things. So, um, so what are the character classes, right? Um, Let's see here. So Luke, the Metropolitan Senate allows us to use of gameplay, mechanics, powers, dynamics, movement during combat. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I would, my gut would kind of tell me that, um, you know, um, oops, where are we at? So enemies, player characters, locations. Um, So, you know, I'm always a big fan of, of having multiple areas. So like cities and stuff can be really great and they offer one type of gameplay. But then, you know, the um, countryside or something like that can offer a whole different type of gameplay and stuff. So that's that can be interesting to me. Um, and then we assume... Um, So I'm going to assume for now, um, you know, that the players are good guys, right? Now we can, we can, you know, gray area that a little bit, you know, and figure out what that is. But why that's important are things like this massive destruction. And Luke, I'm playing off of your, uh, your comment here, um, you know, that this idea of like, again, you know, fighting in cities and, and some of the destruction, you know, um, and things like that. And, and I, you know, of course the, um, Spider-Man's defending people or the Avengers are defending, you know, cities or whatever. Um, but when you get into a city and you start causing massive destruction and you're using your weapons and stuff like that, um, you know, the, um, you know, does the, the, um, you know, um, You know, so can you, um, you know, hurt or kill, um, um, so can you hurt or kill civilians and get penalized, right? And, and so, um, so that's something that we need to ask ourselves because I think when you're really powerful, right, um, there's also a lot of responsibility, as Spider-Man says, you know, that, that goes along with that. And, and we need to understand, like, you know, if the player is just going to start knocking over buildings, whatever, like, you know, do we need something where the, the city's been abandoned? Or, you know, if I use my weapons and my power is wrong, can I hurt people? Can I kill people? And, um, and if I do, then is there a penalty, right? And, and you know, does that make me become bad or, or neutral or chaotic or, or whatever? But that's, you know, a factor of... Um, of you know all the weapons and destruction and things you you could do potentially in the game. Um, let's see here. So I'm going through everybody's comments still. Um, so Luke, as far as supers go, an important dynamic to consider is vulnerability. Um, yeah. So the um, so that's a great point. We need to make sure here is um, or I should say is how is um, each um, you sh for superhero um um so
So the um, so that's a great point. We need to make sure that everything has a weakness, right? And that's that's why I try to stay away from like um, Superman and some of those. Even though Superman has kryptonite and things, I feel like some of them get a little too overpowered, right? Um, Thor maybe a little bit, some others. So so I think in my design decisions. I want to make superheroes that are that do have a vulnerability there, you know, and stuff. And then we have to figure out what those mechanics are. But yes, you're absolutely right. We can't forget about, you know, that when you are that powerful, right? You need to have a, a weakness that can be, you know, rare. And then, you know, um, and then down to, you know, um, So, you know, how is the how are the enemies using that, right? Is this Lex Luthor that's using Kryptonite? Or, you know, do all of the superheroes have the same weakness? Or are they all different? Um, you know, and so I think that's an important question. So, you know... Um, so, you know, that's, that's something we have to think about, right? Like, do the superheroes... You know, maybe they, they all, using just a random example, like if they all came from Krypton or if all these superheroes, because we saw this in like the Star or the, the Superman um, shows, right? Where suddenly, you know, a bunch of the, the Kryptonians came and they're all going to have the same weakness because they came, all came from Krypton, right? And so they're, now they're all going to be, uh, you know, as well as Superman, but they're all weak to, to that um, Kryptonite. So, you know, so in other words, like how, you know, how the, the player superheroes, you know, um, so, um, you know, um, you know, so how did they originate, right? And, you know, and where, and what, you know, um, what gives them their powers? Um, and maybe there's no correlation, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be, but we need to understand that, right? Is that something that's that's there so that the enemies can use one thing against them, some kind of biological weapon, some kind of other weapons, crypt, you know, kryptonite type, you know, thing or whatever, right? Does that affect all superheroes, um, or is it just you know a a particular one, right? So so that's a really really important question for us to to ask. Um, so Luke, um, there is a small group of supers the player controls connects with. And the characters are capable of dying, then add a layer of immersion is likely. Yes, so you do need to, um, and I guess part of this question is, um, um, you know, um, so. You know, if you think about a game like XCOM or something like that, you know, like a, it's more of a tactical game, but uh, like a collection game where you could actually like get a bunch of superheroes, build out your Justice League or build out your your, your Avengers kind of group, right? And like, is it interesting that maybe I've got 12 superheroes, but I can take four at a time, um, but, you know, can one of those permadeath, right? You know, um, and, um, you know, and... So that's that's a tough one. Maybe there's other ways of resurrecting them, you know, and stuff like that. But but yeah, the, the idea of like again, how much damage can they take? Can they die? You know, um, you know, um, you know how to heal? You know, so to speak. You know, all these are really important questions, game mechanics that we have to get into. Um, let's see. So Max, um, powerful is a cheat. Um, is like a cheat in the game. You get bored after 30 minutes and never open it again. Um, so how about selectively powerful, like, you know, in max pain, slow time, and get that power in short burst. Next, deciding how great is the power the character has to be and how weak he is without it. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, part of what we are trying to, um, um, what we're trying to do here is that, you know, you have to create a balanced game. This is like a strategy game or any any game, really. I mean, the, the, the challenge here is not making things... So I want to feel powerful, right? And so so by human standards, when I'm talking about hu, by powerful, right? I need, to, I need to feel more powerful than I do myself. Is Troy Dunaway today, like how I feel as a human being, right? I'm this weak guy 
in you know I'm nothing on this planet in, in comparison to a superhero. But we one of the reasons we like superheroes, right? You know, is one of the things is we want to feel powerful. You know, but that doesn't mean we have to be all powerful, right? We're not aspiring to be a god. We're not aspiring to be something that's omnipotent necessarily. It's more interesting that we're powerful in the sense that we're more powerful than we are as humans. Um, you know, but we're not necessarily so that can be kept in check, right? And so don't um, don't feel like that this has to be something that you know that these guys are so powerful that, like you said, in thirty minutes suddenly you're bored because you're just you you walk around you go dead 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 you all die you're just dead and there's you know you have to have risk of failure right that's part of being a you know, great game and so it's up to us as game designers to figure out that balance right and that's why we talked about mechs and we'll get into some other ideas right but how do we how do we do these things and make it you know kind of fun and interesting right and and i think that's an important part of of the the process but yes i think that um you know um i'll put a note in here um You know, um, so how to how to control the superhero abilities, not make them too powerful, right? So we, we need to understand what that mechanic is, you know, whether that's an energy system, whether it's cooldown timers, whatever that thing is at some point, like any weapon, like any gun that we're going to use in another game, you know, whatever, right? Whether I've got lasers coming out of my eyes or whether I've got other telekinetic powers or whatever, right? There's always limiters. There's always stuff, you know, that, that maybe I've got a really powerful attack, but it literally drains my health, you know, and I start taking damage when I use it, you know, something like that, right? So, so all these things can be balanced, but that's why this is so hard and why the game designer's job is so hard is when you really get into details, you guys are starting to see, like, we've only been talking about this for 30 minutes or whatever. And, you know, and we're, you know, we're seeing that, you know, this one question, you know, when this is applied to like, 20 or 50 superheroes and like how do you balance them all and you know and then all the enemies in the game so maybe hundreds of characters potentially um and stuff like it gets hard like it, this is this is a lot of work like what are their abilities how do i balance them out against each other you know look at any you know like, like a moba even like you know how do i build you know uh a 5v5 you know type map or a game you know that um is balanced when I have 120 different characters that I can throw into that battle, right? So any kind of strategy, tactic game or whatever, um, when they're really powerful, I don't care whether you're a superhero or you're a magician or you're some kind of whatever it is, you know, I would say that even the heroes and, you know, and a lot of the like League of Legends or whatever are, you know, almost qualify as like superheroes, right? I mean, it's fantastical, it's magical, but I mean, their skills and abilities and things like that are, are you know, kind of out of this world right there there's not even really a comparison but but they but they all level out because they all are equal with each other um what i'm because it's a, because right now we're talking about a single player game um i'm proposing something that we can control the balance right we can control this thing because ultimately we know how strong the player is going to be we can control how strong they're going to be and we can know then that the enemies can be and feel stronger right so the player may be the equivalent of say Batman or maybe, you know, Batman and Iron Man and Spider-Man, you know, there's three characters sitting there, but you know, when you've got the equivalent of the Death Star coming in or some, you know, big juggernaut, you know, massive vehicle, you know, maybe is coming in or whatever it is. Right. And they're, you know, they're about to blast the planet, you know, like even those guys would have trouble, like the Avengers and some things like that, like survive through a lot of their incidents because They've got a couple other wild cards, in my opinion, of like Thor and Hulk, who can just do some crazy stuff, you know, and are virtually indestructible. And that imbalances it. And Superman's kind of the same way and stuff. And so I know that they have struggled as an IP universe in that, and that they've, they've got a couple of their heroes that are just so overbalanced. But in the same hand, it's like Hulk's not going to go fly necessarily around the universe and do other things and i mean he does have his limits right like he can't be standing in san francisco and destroy somebody you know in japan right i mean they all have their limits they all have their their stuff and we have to figure out what that is all right um the blasphemer welcome um hope you're doing well today 
Um, let's see. Does it make sense to define like a general flavor or style first? Because when I think about superheroes, it's so diverse. It's kind of hard to pin down ideas. All the Marvel heroes are so different in their abilities and origins. We will get there. Um, right now we're brainstorming. And, and so I don't want to, to restrict things. You know, I want us to kind of be thinking about stuff right now, just in generalization. And I don't, I don't want us yet to get into the specifics of the exact superheroes or whatever. We're just looking for ideas today of like what we like and what we don't like. So, um, so thanks Blasphemer. Hope you're doing well as well. I'm doing okay today. Um, so, uh, Max, so missions, you know, that's a whole nother thing. Um, that kind of comes back to, you know, a little bit of, we've, we've talked about what, what's the player doing, but, um, but what I'll do here is put another header here that just says like, So we, we've kind of, we mentioned this a little bit up higher, but we'll go ahead and put a, a, um, a note, you know, or put a, another area there that we know we need to flesh out. Um, you know, and we can say, um, um, So again, you know, there's um, there's no rights or wrongs here, right? We we are trying to, to build something, you know, trying to design something that's you know that you know is fun, and so I think you know we, we want to capture all these ideas. I do think like enemies and 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 missions and objectives that have timers on them can be really good. Um, they can be you know fun to implement. They can add tension. The problem um, I found, though, and, and through my experience, is when you add an actual timer. Um, so a little bit of kind of game design advice here. When you add an actual timer, what you basically, in essence, do is put a puzzle into the game. And so it, it gates the, the skills of players. So let's just say you add a 30-minute timer. And you have to do this. You have to complete this really complex mission in 30 minutes or you fail. Um, so a player who's really, really good might do that mission in 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Right. And so they're kind of like, meh, that 30 minute timer, like, you know, um, it, it doesn't have a lot of meaning to them because they're like, they never feel really pressured by it. Right. And, and if you try to reduce your timer down to 10 or 15 minutes, then only the best of the best can achieve it. And so therefore your, your general people are always going to fail. And that's a bad thing too. So if you put that timer link to a point that you think is achievable by the average person, um, again, the, the, the hardcore players think it's too easy, but then you get a bunch of players that may not even be able to get past it. Like, you know, it's just like, I've had that in games where I'm like, ah, oh, I, I mean, it always takes me 35 minutes and not 30. And I just, I get close, but I never do it. I don't know how to get past it. Right. So actual timers, while they do seem to add tension, um, can actually work against you as a game designer. And so you have to be a little bit careful. So you can add what, what, what I call indirect tension, um, you know, by ha having, you know, um, what I would call an indirect timer. Now, what that would mean is you can do things where, for example, as the player is progressing through something, whether that's through the entire game, whether that's through a mission or whatever, you can set up a series of triggers. So a trigger would be, you know, something is met. Like you, you, you're kind of tracking behind the scenes, like, okay, let's say that the, the player needs to rescue four people on this particular mission, Right. So something's going to happen when he, when he rescues the first person, the second person, the third person, the fourth person, right? And so what you can have is the sense that there's a timer there. You can have pressure. So, for example, the enemy ship is coming, and it's coming, and it's coming. You don't say the enemy ship's going to be there in 30 minutes. You know, and you're being told through a voiceover or text or whatever, you know, people are screaming. And they're like, oh, my God, it's coming. It's going to be here soon. You know, and you're, and you're, you're adding tension there by adding a lot of drama, but in actuality, the player could sit there for five hours and and the thing would never get any closer. And, you know, but by adding that indirect tension, by adding even just voiceover or something that keeps reminding them like, hey, this is getting bad, you know, getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Those kinds of things um, can add tension without necessarily putting that barrier of actually a timer in there, if, if that makes sense to you guys. And so, and then by having triggers, so like when the, you know, when the person, you know, you rescue the first person or you achieve, you know, goal one and goal two, then goal three, 
that tension escalates up a little bit and you see like that ship's getting closer and closer and closer and you're feeling like, oh my God, this thing's going to blow me up really soon. And, you know, but in reality, you don't have a true timer there. So again, that's why I, I, I want to be careful about that because tension is good and I totally agree that, but, but timers um, become something that can be a slippery slope and really, really difficult to balance, especially if you, have, if you have different difficulty levels of the game and things like that. All right, so let's see here. Oh, so Jonathan decided to join us. I guess he climbed out of bed. Man, some guys. So, hey, Jonathan, thanks for coming this week. So feel free to jump into the foray here of, of brainstorming. We are talking about superheroes. Let's see here. Miguel, how's it going? Um... Let's see, there could be a massive amount of superheroes in this world. We need to recruit them to our team and collect them, book them on Fire Emblem style. Yes. So I don't know how many we have yet, but I really like collection games. And and so that can be something, you know, I don't know whether we have hundreds of these things or dozens. Um, and that's something we need to answer. But but right now that doesn't really matter whether I have 10 or 1,000. Um, to, the, to the scope and scale of what we're talking about in our brainstorming right now, What's important is we know that we have multiple, right? And we don't need to answer the question today about do I have 10 or 1,000 of these things, right? Um, we can have that question mark of do these things die, you know, or can they, if they do die, maybe I got to revive them or whatever. Um, the permadeath situation, stuff like that, even can be worked out later, right? This this is, we're still talking about concepts, right? And, and so don't go down that rabbit hole necessarily. Um, but I agree with you, you know, we have talked about the, you know, collection of, of these things and then I think the, the we'll call it the strategic use or tactical use of these things in the various missions and battles and things like that I think is what becomes really interesting let's see here so Max again um, weapons can balance things better than having 40 characters um, yes and, and to your point Max League is purposely never balanced right um, they, they do that very purposefully and so I, I'm not trying to use that as like a direct correlation um, but um, but I think that's you know an important part now um, that brings up a thing when we talk about weapons right you know um, um, so you know weapons like who who uses them right um, let's see here. All right, one second. Um, let's see. Um, so the, you know, weapons and, and stuff are important. Um, and then, um, you know, so, so part of that is, you know, do they have, you know, weapons and vehicles, right? So, you know, um, So again, keep in mind this is um, science fiction, right? So we're we're not we're not constrained to you know um, our normal everyday Earth world, right? So so if we're building this sci-fi you know universe with with these guys in it, anything is possible. So to your point, like yes, we need to ask like like, like I think Iron Man is a, is a good example um, um, that you know. He built a suit. He put a bunch of powers and abilities in it, right? And that made him a, a superhero. So in a sci-fi world, you could argue that, like, yeah, it's an exosuit and, and stuff. And I would argue that, really, like, Iron Man's a weapon, right? I mean, he's kind of, I mean, it's an exosuit. And it's a different category. 
But like whether he's got you know lasers coming out of his hands or whether he had machine guns or whether he's got swords in his hands or, or whatever it is, right? Those powers, you know, whether those are magical, whether those are technology based, whether those are physical weapons, you know, or whatever it is, there's a really fine line between all these things, right? And I don't want us to limit ourselves right now, but you're absolutely right. Like having weapons um, or whatever can be, you know, and, and even having them interchangeable. So whether those are part of the player superheroes, you know, where, I mean, think about like Batman, right? If you had, you know, Batman and, and you know, Batwoman and, you know, um, Robin and all these things, like, right, they're, they're sharing vehicles, they're sharing a lot of the weapons, the technologies, you know, things like that, you know, in, in their universe, right? And so that's, I would, I would classify a lot of their stuff as weapons, right? And they're not abilities. And this is, this is for us as designers to put in semantically, right? Uh, in the end, I do something and that something, you know, either goes out in a beam or goes out in some way, shape or form and does something to something else, right? That could do damage. It could heal. It could, you know, explode. It could do whatever, right? But, but you know, whether that thing is coming out of my body as part of my natural ability set or whether that, you know, like Superman, you know, blasting people out of his eyes or, something like that, right? Like, like that's what I would call an ability. But that same ability, so to speak, or that same sort of weapon is kind of like Iron Man with his, you know, the lasers coming out of his fists, you know, or Cyclops, you know, as an ability. But, but again, like, do you classify the beams in the, you know, in Iron Man's hands to be a weapon or an ability, right? It's, there, there are a lot of gray areas here. There's no right or wrongs. In the end, this is about, how you as a game designer categorize systems, right? And and then why are you doing that? Well, each thing, you know, might be interchangeable or be, you know, inherent to something else. So for example, why might I have, you know, a bunch of technology and devices and weapons and things that are external that ultimately, you know, why would I do that versus having a bunch of inherent powers? Well, if I'm a bad guy and I'm trying to create, you know, and you're trying to create an army of bad guys, you know, and super soldiers or whatever, right? If I have a piece of technology, however that's done, you know, or a magical ability that can be shared or whatever that, that is, if, if I have that thing, you know, in me, then, you know, I can't really give it to somebody else, right? I can't give it to a thousand soldiers. But if I'm Batman and I've got, you know, whatever weapon that is, or I'm Iron Man, I've got whatever weapon that is, in theory, I could replicate that and give it to a thousand people if I wanted to. And Iron Man did that, um, for a few of his friends and he created some extra suits that were r robotic and, you know, all kinds of different variants, right? I think it was War Machine was one of the other guys um, um, that he, you know, built another suit for and stuff, right? So let's see here. So, yeah, I mean, we got like characters can be used as weapons, you know, um, but again, you know, all these things, it's, it's really, um, um, you know, it doesn't matter. These are semantics right now that at some point we can figure out. In the end, it's just a matter of like, we have different types of abilities or things or whatever. And so, um, so what I'll do here is, um, So, you know, I'm just going to say kind of abilities versus items versus magic or other things, right? So, um, you know, and so they're going to be, you know, things like, um, you know, so, Let's see. So again, you know, things like, you know, do we have, you know, damage, you know, healing, movement, whatever. I'm not going to worry about this, this list exhaustive. I'm just putting some examples there to sort of know that again, like 
damage or any of these things could be done in a wide variety of ways, right? Um, so let's see here. Sorry, guys, trying to catch up on all your great comments, so keep them coming. Um, and, oh, and so... Um, So, so this is an important part of any strategy game, right? The, the rock, paper, scissors, you know, for this. And so, um, so this is kind of, you know, to Miguel, your question, what you're, you know, bringing up here um, is, you know, um, you know, things that we would often call resistances or other kinds of stuff. So I'll put that in here. Um, oops. Um, so what that, I'll leave that there. Um, so what that would be are things like, you know, again, like, you know, I I am immune to or can, or are more susceptible to things like fire, ice, water, electric, you know, whatever. And then those things can, can also do more damage against me or, <coughs> or I can use them. And again, that's part of, it's not just about damage, right? But it's about like, again, you know, who, who's vulnerable to what, right? Um... And so this this all relates to vulnerability. Um, so that can't type. Um, so so anyway, so Miguel, that's kind of where I'm capturing that idea there. Just as far as you know, um, you know, what is players? What is the players? thing do and then what you know somebody else weak towards you know so that's much more than just a basic damage system and you'll see this in a lot of like um rpgs you know especially a lot of fantasy rpgs where i've got a fire sword and you know going up against an ice creature or whatever you know a lot of these make logical common sense you know so they're easier to kind of use but it kind of just varies on what you you know how you want to use it right all right um So, Max, I was thinking on 30 seconds needed for searching the boxes. Others defend the searchers, and you control the horde, which will be there during 30 seconds. Yeah, I mean, you can have little small things where stuff's going to happen. You would typically do those as, as not a timer per se. It's just that, you know, everything has time associated with it, right? Like, I am I need to do something, you know, before something sort of happens. And so, so that's a little bit different. That's the course of, of everything in the game. Like everything in the game, you know, is going to be like, hey, do this, do this, do this, do this. But, you know, do it really quick because the boss is coming or do it really quick because the enemies are coming, you know, and people are trading off that stuff. And that's the nature of what, inherently what a game is, right? And so, so in that particular case, um, Max, that's kind of what there are, what, you know, everything in the game is going to have some or probably going to have some aspect of that. Like, even if you have multiple enemies, like you're, you're worried about like, I got to kill these guys this first way before these next guys come in, you know, cause if I wait for both of them to hit me, I'm going to get, you know, beat up and, and killed very quickly. Right. So like all these are trade-offs, right? They're, you're constantly pr against time pressure. So just so you know, that that's a little bit different than literally saying like, Hey, you got 30 seconds, tick tock, you know, kind of thing, right? And that's that's where it's it's less effective. So having you know stuff that's these indirect timers and pressure is all about what what a game really is. So big glob. Um, so character creation to allow customize you know the superhero as the player progresses unlocks new powers. Yes. So great point. Um, you know, and I think the 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 Marvel games. Um, like if you look at um, you know, especially like these champion online games and, and, and I believe the DC universe, but I know the champions online specifically had like a really, really sophisticated creative player type system. And so I think that is that, or probably could be something that, you know, we need to decide like, you know, um, how, how are these things and what are these things? So let's go up to here. Um, who are the superheroes? So... I think you got a great point there, and I thank you for, for bringing this up. So, 
Um, So, um, so I think that's a, that's actually probably one of the bigger points we need to talk about, you know, first, um, you know, and, and I think this is a, is a challenge, you know, and I think that in a, in a game, so let, let's weigh out the pros and cons for both of this, um, in a, in a game that you're creating, that's an IP when you're creating your own thing. So, um, so I forgot who, I think Max or somebody brought up the point earlier, I forget, I apologize, um, about, you know, again, like the, the license, like a, uh, like a license, the, the Hollywood people want like a license game, you know, they want like Marvel, they want something like that, and the, the importance of having licenses because they want recognizable things, right? So, so that being said, that's a, even in an original IP, when we're building an IP, when we're building something that we want to have and make multiple games out of, when we're building something that's going to that's going to have this life that the player is also going to feel attachment to, there, there's there's not a right or wrong answer here, but we really do need to ask ourselves, like, okay, the, the benefits of having a pre-made character, um, you know, versus the benefits of being able to, to completely and totally create every character from scratch, or is it somewhere in between, you know? So do I start with a base character and then I level them up and, and upgrade them and change their clothes and change their diapers and whatever we got to do to change the, to make them more interesting, you know, throughout the course of the game. Right. Um, but the, the downside, you know, we'll talk this through just for a few minutes because we can go down a huge rabbit hole in this one. Trust me, this, this is a kind of a complicated design challenge and I'd love to actually hear. So let's, let's throw this out to all of you that are, that are here today and, and, and giving all the great feedback. Um, what do you guys think about having 100% customizable characters that the player can just create all of his own stuff, you know, versus having some a bunch of pre-made characters that you get to find and choose, you know, and stuff? Or do you like the idea of maybe having a, a core set of like core superheroes that are maybe predefined and then a bunch of maybe junior type superheroes that you can maybe create, you know, and, and raise up or something like that? And so please comment about that right now. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, cause this is a really important point. And, and I think, um, part of that is that when you have pre-made characters, when you, when you go to create, you know, um, a Marvel game or whatever, right. The, the reason that they are, that they feel better is I'm, I'm familiar with these things, you know? And so I, I know who Superman is. I know who Spider-Man is. I know what their, their skills and abilities, their powers, you know, all these things are, and that familiarity keeps it kind of a little bit easier. So when we're creating a new original IP, one of our problems is that from even a marketing perspective, like, you know, you want to have like a box cover that's got like some cool recognizable characters. And it may not be Marvel or DC, but you can build a brand, right? They may not know it day one, but you, you do enough marketing, you do enough stuff and, and you build these interesting um, characters that are kind of, you know, um, at least somewhat recognizable, right? And, um, and so... So that can be important from a sales or marketing perspective. And also if we have pre-made characters, they can have personalities. You know, they can have a lot of like, you know, this guy, you know, is the jerk and this guy is like really cocky and this guy's, you know, this girl's, you know, very sweet and, you know, or whatever, right? We can develop these very interesting personalities and have, you know, voices and things with them that, that, that are kind of fun and compelling, right? And so the more generic that we make that, the more that we allow players to, create their own stuff, then we just have to give them generic names and they're, they're just, they're, their names are never going to appear in anything but a text mess, their you know, text in the game and everything has to kind of be devalued. And so there are attachment to those characters at some levels decreases because they're not as interesting. But on the same hand, we can argue that, that a player customized character is more compelling because it's my character and I created him from scratch and I got to build him up and level him up and, and, you know, and improve him. Right. And so there's arguments to be made on both sides. And I want you guys to kind of see this challenge. Like this is this is not an easy problem. Like this is this is hard. Of when you're building a brand, you know, do you want to have these characters that I can go out and license? Do I want to have my poster with my superhero. You know, you look at my my Ratchet and Clank 
characters back there, right? I've got Ratchet and Clank center and foremost in the middle of this of this thing, right? Um, look at any you know game box. I don't know, you know, even you know my TNA wrestling game here, which is another character based thing, right? But you want to have like a bunch of these recognizable characters, you know, we're li literally like on your box, on your poster, right? These things become these marketable things, you know. Uh, but even a generic IP, like if you guys look at like mercenaries, right? Like, sorry, I'm trying to make sure the reflection is not too bad here. Um, so again, three characters on screen, you know, and these are the characters that I'm going to play. So this can be, you know, that can be an original IP, but it doesn't mean, you know, just because it's original IP doesn't mean that a compelling named character that, that is really distinct isn't going to be something that helps the brand survive. And then we go off and do Mercenaries 2 and we go off and do, you know, Mercenaries the movie or whatever if we're successful, right? We want to have those characters. But on the same hand, I can see that, you know, having and building my own characters is kind of fun too. So again, please comment about this. Let's talk about this for a little bit. And just, I'd love to hear, you know, what you guys like and don't like in games that have, you know, preset characters versus um, customizable characters. Or what do you think about um, somewhere in the middle, right? And, and doing a little bit of both. So let's, um, let's, you guys keep throwing, throwing some stuff out about that. Um, I want to catch up really, really quick on the, on the comments because we're, we were almost caught up there and I, I don't want to forget anybody's amazing comments here and stuff. So forgive me if I'm, um, you know, if I'm falling behind here, I don't want to, I don't mean to miss anybody's, um, comments here. Um, so it looks like, um, I think we're here. Um, let's see here. Let's see. I think we're at Jules, um, Jules Kings. Um, welcome. Um, so can enemy or characters self heal or heal slower over time or stop mid battle to, to take healing kits? Or do they have other character powers and power strategy? Yes. That's, that's something that, um, I started to put down here is damage in, you know, in healing. So, um, um, So, um, so yes, we don't need to, we don't need to answer that yet. I think the, the answer has to be at some levels. Yes. These superheroes have to take damage, um, to your guys' point earlier. They can't be all powerful, right? I can't be like Superman, you know, with no kryptonite around and I can just literally like nobody can touch me. Right. If I'm Superman, the Hulk or Thor and I'm on a normal planet and I literally just nobody can damage me. The game's going to be fun for 30 seconds while I'm invulnerable, but then, you know, for a while it's, it's going to stop being fun. Right. And so that's something you need to be very aware of. And so, um, so yes, we do need to heal at some point. Um, and, and we need to figure that out, you know, an armor and, you know, all these kinds of systems, but, but we know that that has to exist. And so we don't need to worry about detailing it now in the, in the concept phase, if that makes sense. So don't mean to be, pushing past certain people's you know, questions because I think they're very, very, very valid. But the, the, the key to being a really great designer is knowing what to design and when, right? And so when we're brainstorming, there's just certain things like healing or even damage and weapons. Like I could argue like, oh, let's sit down and, and design all these weapons right now. Well, I don't really need to right now because I know that we're going to have weapons. I know that we're going to have damage. We're going to have different types of damage, you know, and that's all I need to know right now, you know, um, and I don't need to know, you know, that they do area of effect or whatever, because it's probably going to be a whole lot of everything, right? You know, and so, so I don't need to spend the time right now on that if I have a really great innovative idea. But what I'm trying to get to is innovation. I'm trying to find out those core pillars. So a core pillar is not going to revolve around damage and healing. And those, those are mechanics, right? So, so just so you guys understand, today, what today is about is this core of what is this thing, Right? What is this this strange idea we've got? And like, how do we make it special? Right? How do we differentiate it? Um. So Miguel, different abilities can be used not only attack enemies but also reused to um, progress in levels, interact with the environment. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think any of that is I think abilities and how they work with it and, and progress could be done a lot of ways. Right? Where it's literally like I have to move from place to place or I have to do other things, and so that the progression. And using abilities to progress can be done in, in a lot of ways. And we can control that in a lot of ways, you know, and stuff. So, for example, like we got to get from 
planet A to planet B, you know, maybe. And, you know, we have one superhero that can teleport us there as a group, you know, and get us over there. But he has to have a bunch of energy and power. And so I've got to like, we've got to figure out how to charge him up, you know, and then and then he can then teleport us all over there or something. So like that skill or ability could be could be used that way. Yeah, so Jonathan, so, you know, random events, um, you know, we, we can define that later, but what I'll do here so we don't forget about it is mission and goals. Um, so I think, you know, Jonathan, you know, the random events and how we're adding variety and surprise into, you know, into a level, you know, is important. So Luke, um, question is the coordinates between games like Super Smash and Call of Duty. Um, I don't know that, I mean, those are not necessarily, we're not making a fighting game. We're doing an action RPG, right? And so so Call of Duty is still more of a shooter. And so I get your point. We, we do have, you know, a lot of differences there between fighting games versus, you know, shooters, you know, and all that. But um, again, you know, we just need to be careful about which references we're, we're going down and, and um, doing it. All right, so Max, they do not recall any customizable characters. Remember that they were um, amoebas in one game evolving. They had limbs and ears. You might have been thinking of Spore, possibly, with the amoebas um, um, that Will Wright designed. So, um, but, no, I mean, there's there's tons and tons and tons of games that have, like, player customizable characters. You know, most RPGs even are kind of, you know, give you a lot of customizability. So, Miguel, Billy and Jonathan's idea. These, these events could be um, consequences of previous actions, like saving a character that can help us in the future part of the game or finishing enemies and ambush later. So, yes, I think um, what we'll, we'll put here, what that relates to is um, branching paths. You know, um, So, so what you're basically saying there is branching paths. You know, can we have them? Can these random events or other things? And the, you know, am I a good guy? Am I a bad guy? You know, all that kind of stuff, right? All, all kind of relates to, um, to that whole area, right? And that whole thing. And so we need to kind of understand, like, you know, do, do, does the player, you know, can the player become good or bad? And I think that's actually an important part. That, let's put that up here because um, this is part of it. Is I think we kind of. Good guys. Um, but this is also, you know, so that, so this kind of relates to who the, the player character is, right? Does the, does the player, can the player do things that kind of, you know, are bad or good or, or, you know, whatever, and how much can he control the creation of his character? So, Luke, yeah, Super Smash Bros. Memphis shaping decades-long stories, evolutions for each character. Yeah, because they had all these great licensed IPs, and that's my point of, like, you know, again, like, I guess what your point is is that you have recognizable characters versus Call of Duty's, like, generic characters. And yes, there again, there's not a right or wrong here as a game designer, but it's really just like, what do we want and why, right? Yeah, Max, the, I don't remember that saying, go for the eyes, boo, go for the eyes, but yeah, that's, I think I've seen that in a movie as well. So Big Glob, um, I guess it depends on the IP, if it's, it's someone else's IP, um, yeah, so so big lob. We're we're for the for the case study today that we're we're trying to do. We're going to try and create our own original IP, and so we're not going to use Marvel or we're we're using those the Marvel DC characters as a point of reference only because it's a language that we can all talk about. But but just to be clear, we are planning to create our own original IP. So the question is now: Should that IP have you know named characters with with you know, somewhat fixed skills or maybe partially fixed with some customizable skills all the way to like completely and totally customizable characters 
where literally, you know, the player starts maybe with his first random character and then, you know, somehow can find more and, and randomly generate more or build more, customize them. Like, how far do we go with that, right? Do, do we literally, you know, meet a character in the game and they're like, hey, I'm Spider-Man, you know, and I can do X, Y, and Z. You know, can I join you? You know, like, like is it like that or is it more like, you know, I go to the lab and I create one of these things and I can customize them any way I want. Like, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can skin that proverbial cat. And that's what we're talking about right now. So, yeah, the Call of Duty is hard to balance. Like, you know, every game is hard to balance, right? That's that's the nature of all, all of these things. So, the Blasphemer, thanks for joining. Um, like having the, some customization, you know, if it's RPG style, yep. Um, and, um, let's see. And, and I think this is, this is both visual customization and as well as, is, um, powers, skills, and abilities, and kind of the inherent who we are, right? So I think a middle ground, which I'm kind of maybe partial to just from from first blush of, you know, first ideas, would be something where maybe we, we can start with a, a category or class of character. So we go meet some junior level person in the game. Maybe they're, you know, out there fighting crime on their own. You know, maybe they're, you know... Um, at a school or, you know, like the thing about the, the Academy, um, in X-Men, right. And, um, the professor Xavier runs and, you know, and all these like kids with powers, but they're kind of untrained and not that good. And so maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the characters that come could either be fully formed. And so we would meet these more senior people and they would have a, a really high cost, you know, for coming on board. And so I could recruit, you know, these fully fleshed out people that come with, you know, they can even bring vehicles and they can bring their own spaceships and they can have their own skills and abilities and whatever it is, right? These guys could be as fleshed out as we wanted them to be, um, but it's going to cost us, right? And we, we, we may not be able to get that to a little bit later in the game. Now, we could also go like hire, you know, recruit these junior level people um, and these junior level people could have skill trees and slots and, you know, and things that I could give them some combination of, of abilities, weapons, you know, whatever. I can teach them new stuff or maybe I can imbue them with new skills, abilities, and powers. And this comes back to, you know, you know, how do they originate, right? Like this is an important question that this is kind of asking is because, you know, if there's something that, that we are doing, if, if you look at like Wolverine, for example, right? Wolverine was not a, a Wolverine was not born as a natural superhero, right? He was a soldier. Um, and even Captain America is another example of this, right? These were guys that were experimented on, right, through technology. Um, and really, you know, kind of, you know, not the best, you know, uses, but it was wartime. And they were experimented on and people did bad things to them for arguably good or bad reasons and then ultimately created these like very, very, very powerful superheroes, right? Um, and so that would be an example of like where we've, where, you know, even in the, the, the licensed universes where certain characters have been upgraded, so to speak, over time. Um, you could argue that even like um, Iron Man, you know, he's gotten new suits and better suits. Batman keeps coming up with new devices. He had a Batmobile and then suddenly he's got the Bat plane, the Bat bike and the Bat whatever it is, you know, and, and so he's constantly evolving, right? So, so our characters don't have to be static, right? Now, the inherent nature of magic, what I'll call, or, or superhuman abilities, is that the part of that problem of that thing is that the, the inherent nature of those things is that quite often it's kind of like, oh, well, your category is this, right? But, but I see this as more potentially like D&D, &D, right? Where we have a, the equivalent of a mage, or some sort of category of, of superhero that has some base abilities. And then we can build off of that, right? We can upgrade them. We can spend time, you know, through training or equipment or, you know, using a device or whatever that is, we can, we can make these superheroes better. And so now we have an upgrade path, right? We have th something to spend money on. We need to go look for these things. You know, maybe we need a special, you know, maybe the origin of these superheroes came from like, a meteor that crashed and it was a it was a you know something that a special radiation i mean think about like the hulk 
the Hulk was really created as well, right? I mean, he did it to himself, but that was a that was again technology that created you know the gamma radiation from the Hulk was created there and it modified him, right? So so imagine if if this substance we'll call it for now. And I'm brainstorming, right? So maybe we have this, maybe we don't. But if there was a substance that that imbued you know powers into people and and stuff, then maybe some people have been created through the substance, you know, this radiation, whatever this is. And if we get more of it, we can keep upgrading them and powering them up and getting them stronger and better. And so you kind of, you know, maybe you're going around and collecting more of this substance or, or whatever you're doing with it. And then you can imbue it into the superheroes you want, you know, to make that particular superhero stronger. Right. And so, so don't, we don't have to assume that you're basically born with these abilities and that's all you're ever going to have. Right. And so that's the way I kind of see that these characters could be interesting. These characters can have their name. They can have their base abilities. You know, they can have their personality. Um, and then we can grow them over time, you know, with new stuff. And I, I think that kind of sounds interesting to me. But what do you guys think? Let me... Um, um, so, and again, right now, I'm really honestly talking about gameplay. Just to be clear. So... I assume that, you know, characters potentially can get customized and change outfits or whatever. Like, that's easy. Like, that, I mean, that's a known, easy, solvable technology that we don't have to even talk about customizing how somebody looks, whether it's their costumes, whatever. Like, of course, we can customize all that. Whether whether that is a randomly generated character or whether it's a pre-made, you know, character that, that we're going to make as game designers with a story around them and stuff, we can still change their clothes, right? So, so you know it's more a matter of like that's that's not a problem we need to solve right now this is really the inherent of the gameplay systems mechanics and that has to be tightly imbued into the world right and this whole how they originate right and, and so so you can see that we're struggling with story and game mechanics and this is why I, I, I teach and tell people like you need to make these things work together to make them great you can you can easily kind of go like well here's their story and you know there's there's their origins and you write this whole complex thing and you're like, now go make this fun. And you're like, uh, like maybe that sucked, you know. And and so you you need to kind of work on these problems together sometimes. All right, still going through all the great comments here. Um, you know, so um, so the blasphemer. Also, I could see pre-design uh, uh, iconic main superhero without any pre-existing IP going horribly wrong. Um, Yes, I mean, there's always a risk of creating a new and original IP, right? And especially in superheroes when you've got two really strong dominant franchises. But I'd also argue that there has been some decent um, new and original superheroes shows, TVs, movies, you know, and even games that, you know, have featured superheroes that were completely new and original. And yes, they were not DC or Marvel, but um, but you got to remember that the cost savings alone um, you know, if, if it's going to cost us 25% of our budget to, to go license a big license, like, you know, if I don't have that in there, like, yes, I may not sell 10 million copies, but if I can sell 5 million copies, I can still make just as much money with an original IP because I don't have to pay Marvel or, or somebody else a bunch of money. Right. So, so these are all questions to be asked, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. We're still going to just assume that we're making an original IP. And, I, and again, we can keep arguing whether it's good or a bad idea. And I'm not going to say that not having a uh, an original IP or original hero might be something worth doing. But the limitations that that puts on us, right? And I think that's part of the reason that Last Avengers game did so bad is when you work and you're trying to make a certain type of game and all of your characters have just such like recognizable personas and skills and abilities and all these things, it makes it really hard for you to to um, um, innovate, right? As game designers, like and you want me, you may want to have X, Y, and Z abilities, and you're like, oh, I can't do that because the characters I've got don't have those abilities, and so now I got to make these guys balance against this. And when you work with a licensed character, you get a certain amount of recognition from that, which is great, but you also suffer because um, the you know the you know the the superhero that you're building is not going to be as fun potentially as just if you could do something in your own, of your own right because as game designers we can make these guys more fun. So um, Miguel, each planet could be protected by a hero. 
Possibly, but one of the, the things we talked about earlier is that we want to try to have, um, you know, four superheroes, you know, at any one time. And so I don't want to get too big in the universe. And also from just a, a quick aside, like a, as an art, from an art production standpoint, um, the, every world we add is like a whole lot of extra art and a whole lot of different stuff. And so I, I don't want to have a hundred worlds, right? I don't want to have to generate that kind of thing. And I don't want the worlds to necessarily be controlled that way. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have areas, places, things that are all patrolled by, controlled by, or, or whatever, some heroes, and we can go find them, right? But I mean, I, I think you can argue that even in like Thor or, you know, different characters, you know, um, Batman, you know, protects Arkham City and Spider-Man protects his city. And, you know, like everybody, most superheroes have something they're protecting, right? Um, and so, so I think whether it's at a planetary scale, city scale, or a block scale or whatever, um, you know, we need to figure that out. But, but I want to, from an art production standpoint, be aware that, you know, having too much art, you know, becomes tricky, you know, if we're going to have to go down to each planet or something like that. Let's see. Um, Max, Baldur's Gate, there's a giant space hamster. And it's one of the most recognizable pets in gaming history. Um, yeah, so, you know, you could also, an important part of superheroes here, which we'll um, put here are, that's a great, um, Brainstorm there, sidekicks. Um, um, so, you know, again, you know, in a lot of games, you, you can get kind of the equivalent of a sidekick. You know, you can get a minion, you can get, you know, a mount, you can get all sorts of things like that. Um, so, but in the superhero stuff, there's always like sidekicks around and, you know, people like that, you know, and so, um, um, so I think that's a that's a good point that we have to remember, like the equivalent of Robin or whatever it is, right? You know, um, with you know that it is to Batman or whoever, right? They all have their their people around them that, that perform certain functions, and um, bah. so what functions do they perform, right? And and I think that's a that is a big part of a lot of the superhero culture. So I think that's um, uh, a good question to kind of ask. Um, so the boss I always love um, creating my own characters, see how they grow over the course of a game, also customize your own superpowers, can be very neat and possibly selling points. Yes, and, and that's why I think customize, customizing and growing characters is really important. And, and you want to make these things your own, and you want to, you know, um, figure out how to... Um, you know, make this thing, you know, exciting and compelling, right? Um, Jonathan, the, um, the compound V from the TV show, The Boys. I haven't seen The Boys. Um, I'll probably have to go watch it. So um, did they have a, was there a compound in that that they would take? Or how was that um, um, compound used in, in The Boys specifically? So Max, yes, we were talking about limiting power-ups that will go into a skill tree. So yes, I think everybody has some kind of skill tree. And again, categor categorizing things and stuff was what we'll get into next week. You know, and talking about like, okay, what kinds of these things might they, they be or, or whatever. So um, so that's an important point. Um, so Max, again, um, there are already existing heroes um, in comics with pre-existing fans. Someone has already spent a lifetime to build minor um, comics he has a great idea to be implemented cheap and out of the box possibly and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna keep arguing this with you guys I mean I, I I totally see the value in licensing something but the point of this exercise is to do world building and show you guys how to build something from scratch so just keep that in mind this is not about if it's the right choice for this project right now I do want to go through the exercise because we've talked about world building um, so much in the past that this is about world building Right? And this is about teaching you guys a skill. And then again, um, it sounds like there's a lot of interest to this. I think what we'll, what we'll loop back to is, again, how to now take a, you know, a, a new and original IP, like I talked about in the beginning, and go make a, a licensed game out of that. You know, so we could take this new and original IP game and now assume that like Marvel loves our game. We haven't launched it yet. They, they see what we're doing. They're like, hey, we're going to pay $10 million to go make this a Marvel game. What do you think? 
right? And you know, and what does that um, do? You know, do for the game, right? So that's just something that, you know. We that's an exercise we can go through, but let's not keep um, going down that path because again, I, I agree, superhero and licensing, whether it's even a minor comic or whatever. But again, the the point I'm trying to make is that every every pre existing character um, has limitations. Right, and so if you go license something, you're going to have those limitations. And yes, you can argue that you can make the characters faster and cheaper at some levels. But from a game design perspective, from a game play perspective, the the problem when we build off of a license is that we have to kind of say like, okay, this character has X, Y, and Z, and I can't change that, right? And this other character has A, B, and C, and this other character has you know one, two, and three, right? And now I got to like make them fight, and I'm like, ew, but they're not balanced, right? I'm mean, trying to get Thor to fight Spider-Man or something like, you know, or, or, you know, something along that lines. Like it, it doesn't quite make sense. They're, they're, they're unpowered, you know, they're, they're, you know, or even, you know, even like Spider-Man or no, sorry, Superman versus Batman, that movie. Um, I had a really hard time with that one. Cause I just didn't see like Batman even being able to be in the same room as Superman and hold his own. And the movie did an okay job, you know, explaining that, but, but I always felt there was this massive imbalance there. And, and so that becomes a reach. But that's the problems you start running into when you're like going to have to use a license thing and somehow you got to try to make these two things fight or, or work together or whatever. And like it may not be very fun. And then you're like, oh, God, I, like that's that's a harder experience than just saying like, hey, I can change the character. Right. So let's see here. The blasphemer. um so, um, so maybe we create our main character ourselves. The companion heroes we recruit during the um, during the story are predefined personality, Dragon Age style. We would um, also define our origins and class and character creation. Yeah, something probably along that lines where we look at you know um, you know maybe the equivalent of a, of a D and D style kind of game where we have like I'll call them races for now, but but those could be categorizations. Or maybe it's races. I mean, you know, the equivalent so there. And then, like, character classes, right? So I want to be, you know, a, a fighter, mage, you know, cleric, you know, whatever that 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 D&D kind of categorization. But then I've also got, you know, orcs and elves and humans and, you know, things like that. And so, so whether it's literally, like, um, those kinds of things remapped to a superhero game or whether it's just like, hey, I've got, you know, um, character classes and different kinds of things, you know, they're, they're choosing there. But I do imagine the player has some fixed things he has to choose from, you know, and then he can kind of choose a general path that, that this character is going to go down, right? And he can decide what, you know, what he wants to have, you know, in the game. Um, so, Max, um, World of Boys in a video game. I'll have to go check out The Boys. I think I saw it on Amazon. Um, it was Amazon Prime, I think, have it. The boys, I think that was where I saw that. So I'll, I'll, I'll maybe have to go check that out tonight. Um, so Jonathan, how about maybe having to choose? Um, let's see here. How about having to choose a superhero faction? Um, may cross paths from other superheroes from other factions. This is where we could introduce superhero versus superhero gameplay. Yes, that, I think that's the the basis of what we need to decide, you know, is like, are the, are the heroes, the enemies, you know, this kind of comes back to this point, right? Do they have superpowers, you know, um, you know, um, you know, what are the factions? Um, you know, what, what are all these things, right? So, um, and then, um, we'll have to go check out the boys, um, and stuff. Um, so Max, discuss ideas, stealing ideas from other existing heroes or worlds. Um, you know, um, try to superheroes, weapons, weaknesses, blah, blah, blah. Yes. So, um, um, one of my goals, which we didn't get to today, was I was going to go through this this um, GURPS book and brainstorm ideas. Uh, we'll do this next week. Um, you guys had so many comments I had to keep up on, so we, we kind of um, you know went went down a different path today. But I, wa I wanted to make today more interactive, you know. So I'm great and, and very 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 thankful to you guys 
um, for having such a great conversation today. And really, honestly, like I, I really appreciate everybody chiming in um, and uh, Max and Miguel and Jonathan and, you know, Blasphemer, everybody like, you know, and I know I forgot a few of you in there that, that chimed in, Big Lob. Um, amazing work today. Like, you know, you guys, um, you can just see like we're just scratching the surface, right? In this hour or so, hour and a half or so that we've been brainstorming, right? In a real world environment, you know, as a game design team, we would be doing this kind of every day. Right. This is a, this is what our job is like. Right. We're, we're in this room and we're banging our head against the wall. and We're like, God, I got to solve this problem. Right. And, you know, and, and I got a bunch of other people in the room that I'm trying to solve it with. And, and they may help me and they may like put me down rabbit holes. And they're like, no, I hate that idea. That sucks. And you're like, wait, no, I believe in it. And then you got to go sell them. Right. You got to you got to be like, you know, getting them to believe you and believe in you. And um, so, um you know, unfortunately, you know, for you guys, you know, I'm here as, as the god of this live stream, you know, and I'm in complete and total control, you know, and I can do whatever I want to do. So, you know, so I don't have to listen to any of you, but <laughs> that's, um, but I do. And I do appreciate the comments, but it's it's hard to, um, um, you know, to to do that. But but that's the great job of a game designer, right? Is that we, we literally kind of sit around and we brainstorm a lot during the days and it sounds really easy, but as Jonathan and, and my other students, you know, can tell you, it sounds really easy. Then try to actually do it. And when you actually try to do this, it's 10x harder. Imagine doing this 8, 10, 12 hours a day and like trying to come up with new ideas. And they all like this idea conflicts with this idea and doesn't work with this idea. And you keep chasing rabbits all over and your ideas are just going all over the place and your mind melts. Right. And so so you can see like what we did in just an hour or two. And imagine, again, doing that 40 hours a week you know, 80 hours a week, really, you know, and, and stuff. And it's, it's a really hard job. And, and you start like, again, conflicting yourself or other people start conflicting one idea against another and all that kind of stuff. It, it gets really, um, 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 it gets really challenging. So yeah, 10 hours a day, maybe you get pizza. Most, most teams, maybe you got to work 12 to get the pizza and the, and the free dinner, but you know, depend depends on how generous your company is. But, um, yeah, I mean, game designer job is probably a sixty-hour, eighty-hour a week job in a lot of companies, and you got to be aware of that. But I'm, I'm using that to exaggerate that this is a, it is a hard job. It's not just like we sit around and play video games all day. Um, this ideation process is kind of the easiest in that we, we're kind of come up with stuff, but it gets harder and harder and harder the more when you try to, as they say, devils in the details. And we're going to get into that, you know, in these weeks to come. So, um, so again, thanks everybody. Um, really do appreciate it. Um, unfortunately we're out of time today time flies when we're having fun so i hope you all appreciate it you know i hope you all um, enjoyed today's conversation um again thank you all so much for participating in today's talk and being part of of my stream and um i hope everybody has a great week and i hope to see you all next week and we'll we'll keep um we'll keep going next week on this idea and just keep you know so so during this week think about you got some homework this week think about ideas related to this and come next week with some more ideas but I think you'll start to see as we keep going down these paths, your brains will just start working and you'll you'll have a million ideas, you know, and you can't even turn off the big spigot. So hopefully that's the way it'll come for you. So have a great week, everybody. Thanks again and take care. Bye now.